Good morning. Welcome to another webinar Wednesday, Wales Derby. You got myself, Rick Coster. You got Anthony Tassi next to me here. Good morning. He will be answering any questions we may have. So, you know, feel free to throw those questions in a box before we start and begin. If you guys can just throw where you where you're uh, watching today from, um, also that you can hear us. You know, that'll be another good thing. I think we kind of fumbled a little bit last time we did this, but uh, we should be good. Uh, so yeah, just let us know that you can hear us. So today we're going to cover the Fujitsu multi-positional air handler. Uh, we've done this in the past, so we keep adding a little bit here and there and some of the updates that come through. So we should get some more information here than maybe previous webinars we've had. So we've given you some info here. Uh, Anthony, I believe you put in the chat, chat there. We've got some handouts for you guys. See some answers maybe? No, nobody. Nobody can hear us yet? No, so, I have nothing. Everybody's shy this morning, so. I guess so. We've got a couple handouts here. If not, we'll just talk to ourselves for the next <laughs> six hours. But uh, no, we'll be, we got about 45 minutes to an hour today, maybe a little over. We'll see how it goes. But um, it was try to give you guys some, as much information in a short amount of time. Thank These you, webinars are, we do get, thank you, Donald. Appreciate yeah. it. So you guys can hear us. You can see us. But, so we got you some handouts over there. We got the um, Fujitsu full line catalog. Um, I threw in, I like this little piece. We call it the startup sheet for the multi-position air handler. This is something that you guys, you know, on a job, you'll be able to record any function codes that you've changed, refrigerant charge, line set lengths, you know, the homeowner's info, uh, model serial numbers, stuff like that. So this is good information to hold on to, especially with the amount of different uh, function codes that we do have and maybe changes we're making depending on your application. And then as always, we have our uh, two-page um, Wales Darby line sheet. So those are all the other manufacturers that we do represent. It's not just Fujitsu, right? 34 of them, I think, last time I counted the new sheet, and as well as our contacts. So you will have them at the end as well, a little QR code. So if you're watching on a computer today, you'll be able to scan that QR code. You'll have myself and Anthony's information there. Um, but yeah, any questions that we don't get to, you know, feel free to reach out, look at the contact sheet. You'll see me, Anthony, and as well as John, Jim, and Rob on our New Jersey side. So throw those questions out there. But like I said, you know, best part of a webinar is being able to talk throughout the whole process. So Anthony would be there engaging you guys. You know, if it's just conversation or you got questions, concerns, anything about the multi-positional air handler, throw it in there and uh, hopefully we can answer. So some of the stuff we're going to cover today, you know, obviously some of the comparisons and, and the different models that we have out there, you know, with the multi-position air handler. We're going to go through some of the components and accessories, you know, briefly, uh, but more importantly, the installation practices, some of your connection points. Uh, we're going to go through some maybe some application stuff there, some of the stuff we're seeing now that we're transitioning kind of with fossil fuels and stuff like that. So we can connect with different, uh, you know, I guess based on your application, we can connect to pretty much anything at this point. So we'll look at a couple of those and then obviously questions don't have to be to the end, you know, throw them out there throughout. Anthony gets bored easily. So keep them, keep them going. Anything else you want to add, Ant, before we get moving? No, I think the lineup's great for this morning, and handouts are uh, always a bonus for you guys. When you have any questions, like Rick said, just uh, chat, put it in there, and we'll, we'll get you uh, an answer. Beautiful. Like I said, I don't know if I mentioned it, but you know, everything that we're doing here today or we've done in the past, you know, it is all recorded. So you will see that on our HBAC Insiders webpage. I will have, a, I believe, a slide at the end with a link there so you guys can see it. Let's see how we go. So just like any training we do, um, you know, the, the training itself is based on, you know, concept and everything. It's not to be used as the basis of your design. Pick up an installation manual for once, open it. There's some good information in there. There's a lot of different manuals and you will see them. We'll talk about some of the different things we do have out there uh, going forward. So with that, See if I move this guy. Let me turn on a little laser pointer here. Like that. Good. All right. So when we talk about the multi-position air handler, you know, you might see some new additions that I threw on here, tried to update this a little bit. But in the past, we always had our two, two and a half, three, and four-ton air handlers. Um, 
we do have now the addition to our two and a half, three and four ton uh, extra low temperature heating, right? Those we call them the H models. If you remember them from other mo uh, other uh, product lines we've had. So the H models obviously get us some lower temperature cooling or uh, heating there at minus 15 degrees. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. But you know, and then we're adding and adding more and more. You know, we've kept the single. I didn't get to throw the picture in there, clog this up too much. But you know, you notice one of the big comparisons that we see to other stuff is maybe the size of that outdoor unit. And we'll look at that in a minute, but the four ton extra low temperature heating model is the only one that's going to go to a double stack fan. So everything else is going to stay relatively small with a single fan better for, you know, when you're looking to hide these things under windows and stuff like that. So when we talk about comparisons, you know, we're always talking about unitary, tra you know, traditional systems. When you've seen this, if you've seen this air handler before, and I'm sure you have, this is not new to you know the air conditioning world as far as a multi-position air handler. But what it's what's new is the fact that we're working with an inverter condenser, right? We use an hour mini split out typical ductless uh, condenser now with a multi-positional air handler. So you get in the benefits of that full inverter you know piece of equipment, where traditionally you know you you don't have a lot going on there. When I say that, right, we're going to look at some of the reasons why. Say that, right? So we use an inverter compressor. I said that a couple of times already, but you know, traditionally you got a scroll compressor. That thing goes one speed, right? Zero to 100. You turn a call of cooling comes on for one degree or six degrees. It doesn't matter. You're getting the full capacity of that outdoor unit, right? There are some other inverter, you know, traditional looking stuff out there. We're not talking about them today, but your traditional unitary condenser at zero to 100 doesn't know any better. Right. So with the inverter compressor, obviously, we have some better uh, capacities that we can push out. If we don't need them, we don't use. Them. Right. We meter just like a ductless system right now, metering devices in that outdoor unit where traditionally they have a TXV or a metering device is in the actual air handle. So some differences there. You know, again, we talk about the motors, they're variable speed DC fan motors. When you talk about a traditional system, possibly you might have an ECM motor in there. You might have a. Um, Two stage, you know, a fan motor in there or something like that. You know, it's oh, it's not, you know, typical, but when you get into those higher sears, you will see something like that. So, a big difference there, energy savings wise. I think, but more importantly, why most people, most of the people that I know, contractor wise, that are going to this Fujitsu multi position air handler is because of the electric, right? We power just like our ductless systems, we power our indoor unit from our outdoor. So that means to you, one double pole breaker is going to power that entire system, where traditionally you're using two double pole breakers, one for indoor, one for outdoor. Now, there is one similarity, and that's basically the electric heat kit that you can get with it. Um, it's a strip that you would add. It's an accessory. right? So if I was adding electric heat, I would need a separate breaker. So traditionally, you would need three breakers if you would do an electric heat. With this, with ours, you know, if you had a traditional replacement, you know, you might be able to utilize that second breaker that was already ran to the attic for your electric heat, depending on the breaker size and, and the element you're putting in there. So the work's already done for you, which is really nice. You get both uh, the benefits of both, you know, electric strip and electric heat pump. So there are some, that's probably the only similarity. Uh, coil wise, it's the same. It's our guts, it's Fujitsu's boards, right? So that's what really makes this system different. When we talk, if this is your first time hearing about a multi-position air handler, you know, really it's just multi-positions, right? Upflow, downflow, horizontal left and horizontal right. And we'll look at where, you know, we might have to make some adjustments there. The cooling and heating range, minus five out of the box, right? That's not an extra low temperature heating piece of equipment. So where we are, typically that, that's going to cover, you know, your heating loads and your cooling loads throughout the whole year. You know, we will be able to, if you're missing some, you know, BTUs there, and we need some additional or supplemental heat. Again, you know, we could go to an H model. We could just go integrate with your current heating system, which is really nice. Uh, we could add an accessory electric strip, and we'll, we'll look at the different sizes and the BTUs on those guys and some of the capacities. Uh, you know, max piping length, we'll look at some of that stuff. 230 feet for the three and four ton systems is pretty far. You think about, you know, what you traditionally um, and the size of the line set, you'll see some big benefits there. So I was talking about manuals before, right? This training is, is basically just a conversation at this point. You know, we're going to talk about, you know, a lot of the installation connection points, stuff like that. But based on your application, you know, you want specific information. You need to get to the installation manual. You know, you need to know what you can and can't do. How do I change the coils out? How do I reverse coils? Stuff like that. 
that's where that install manual is going to come into play. You know, we have installation instructions. We got design and technical manual. That's going to be, you know, again, your application. What are you looking to do? You know, what kind of design, what kind of uh, options do you want to give? All of that stuff's in the design and technical service manual, troubleshooting, parts list. We got some bulletins out there now. You know, I'll show you where those are. But all of this stuff can all be found at the Connect site, right? So that's connect.fujitsugeneral.com. That's where all the information is. Put the model number in the search bar of the air handler you're working on or any model of Fujitsu you know, you're working on and you'll have access to all of these manuals. So it's not hidden. You don't have to log in to find it. So it's it's free access for you guys there. Where in the past, I, you know, you might have needed to log in. You know, nomenclature is big for us, you know, especially myself, Anthony, Jim, John, and Rob, you know, we work heavily on the tech support side. You know, we're trying to help you guys when you're, you know, getting in trouble there. Nomenclature, you can get yourself into trouble. If we don't know, not, not, I don't want to say know what all the letters and numbers are, but if you don't use them all, right? If I'm asking you what model you're working on, I don't want to hear it's a 36,000 multi-zone, you know? Well, which one? We have a couple of them, right? So if we leave a one off the end or something like that, we could be talking two different systems and I can be giving you advice for two different systems or parts that aren't really meant for your system. So we need to know all of them. They have changed over the years and recently, I would say over the last year, we've seen some big changes with the revisions and stuff like that and the new models coming out. So A is our heat pump, right? We don't, again, we don't need to memorize all of these, but A is gonna be our heat pump. There we go. M for multi-position, make it easy. The big one, G is our generation. Right, so right now we have some H's. So you'll see the model numbers that I had on before, and I think I pop them up again in a little bit. But H is our newest revision, and then our capacity. Our L is going to tell us it's an inverter heat pump. We don't make cooling only pieces of equipment anymore. So it's interesting that they even have it on the slide. Um, tier, right? So high tier, mid tier, entry level stuff, right? You can tell that all by the second letter after the capacity. We have some series here and then features indoor, S for standard, H for extra low temperature heating. Um, another one with some other models of Fujitsu, you might see a one where in the past that was our revision or series, right? That one now might represent that it's a single zone system. So if I have a one at the end on something brand new, I might want to check if I'm working on a multi-zone and I got a condenser with a one, number one, if you open up the box, you might see there's only one set, you know, set of uh, ports there for your line set. So that'll tell you right off the bat. But these letters and numbers can tell you a lot of information, especially when you're looking for help. So please just anytime, send us a picture, worst case, and then we can get it all for you. So we talk about comparisons on size, right? So these are the two and two and a half ton models. Um, when you look at some of the competitors, yes, yeah, so, you know, we are one of the smaller condensers, right? So if you're looking to hide something for a homeowner, this might be important, right? They don't want to see the box on the side of the house. You know, we're, we're replacing a traditional piece of equipment, you know, most likely they're not going to care what the size of ours is because it's going to be a lot less, you know, so a couple inches here and there is not going to make a difference. But, you know, height wise, you know, Footprint wise, it, it's going to be a, a big difference compared to unitary, you know, but compared to some of our competitors that might have multi position air handlers, we're still small. Um, when we get into those three and four tons, like I said before, you know, we stay with the single uh, fan. It's not till we get up to the four ton guy where we're in an extra low temperature heating model that we step up into that double fan. So I think that's pretty uh, important for some people. Sound wise, again, you guys know if you've worked with mini splits before how quiet these outdoor units are. In most cases, you just gotta walk up to them, put your hand in front just to see if things run, right? So that's that carries over. At the loudest, we're gonna be about 55 decibels. That's our max. When you look at where 55 lines us up down here, that's well under the minimum of any traditional, you know, uh, condenser, you know, any manufacturer. So it's definitely quiet. I saw I saw a uh, publication. I think it was an ad for the, how quiet these guys were. You know, they were comparing, saying we need about four or five of our outdoor units to equal the sound of one traditional heat pump. So, you know, it's pretty quiet. You know, this is one of the reasons why we're so quiet. And if you pulled open and you had to work on a Fujitsu before or any type of mini split. Really, when you open up that front door up here in the top left and you pull that guy off, you're going to see a ton of insulation, right? We wrap that compressor up, right? So that kills a lot of the noise right off the bat. Also, it's its own little chamber pretty much, right? So the compressor is sealed. It's away from the fan. 
it's away from anything else, you know, you really got to get in there to see it. Where traditionally, when you look at a unitary system, you can see it just by looking in the top, right? There is no insulation. It's directly below the fan. So any noise that's being made from that system is just being thrown right out the top. So it's a very easy to hear. So you do have some that are out there now that they are, again, high sear, where you're paying a couple more bucks for them. They might have some insulation over them. They might even have a little box over them or something like that. That helps kill some noise. It will be quieter, but it's not going to be quieter than the ductless, you know, condenser. Um, I did mention the heat before minus five degrees. You know, this is really this slide, and, and I think the next couple ones really talking about capacity here. You know, this gets pretty important. You know, minus five is just our. This is where you're going to get our rated capacities. That doesn't mean we work down to minus five, shut off, and that's all you're gonna get, right? So when we hit minus five and now even minus 15 with our extra low temperature heating models, you know, it doesn't stop right there. When we look at a capacity chart, again, this is something found in the design and technical manual. You know, here's our minus five. And I might be blocking a little bit, but it's all right. I can, you can see. Minus five up here, 72 degree set point, we're getting about 28,000 BTUs out of this machine, right? So it doesn't stop at 28,000. Yes, it will derate a little bit. And if you look through the math, we're losing about 4,000 BTUs every time we go down, you know, on this chart, you know, so this next number could be, you know, minus 15 and we might be at 24,000 BTUs out of a 36,000 model, which you can see here on the top left. And I think the numbers here are pretty impressive at 36,000 BTUs. We're getting over 36,000 BTUs down to 14 degrees. I know in the Northeast where we are on Long Island, I mean, that's going to cover most of our winter here. And this is not an extra low temperature heating model, right? We're not engaging electric strip heat. This is solely just the heat pump itself and its performance, right? So if I need to get some more or extra BTUs out of the machine, we'll, we'll take a look in a few minutes on uh, how we can do that. Um, just keep in mind, you know, we do not shut off, you know, once we hit that rated, you know, rated temperature or once that chart disappears, it's not like it's gone. You know, but anytime, and I know Anthony will appreciate this slide, anytime we talk about capacities, right, there's a lot of variables that come into play, right? And, and this is a chart that I took out of the design and technical manual, and this is something I think we should, you know, if we are running longer line set lengths or running the maximum of what we can do, this is something that we should be aware of, right? When you think about, you know, the rated capacities of a system, we're talking about, what was it, 20 feet of line set, 25 feet of line set? 24 feet, seven inches. 24 feet, seven inches, all right? And it's zero elevation. So that's put on a table, right? So your condenser and your air handler now are on the same level, which typically is not gonna be the case. And you ran only 24 feet, seven inches of line set. Then you're gonna get all of those numbers you just saw on that last slide. But if I have any type of variable in between here, right? So let's expand this a little bit more, right? So across the top here, we have the length of line set. So here's up to our 230 feet, 229 in this case. Um, and here's our height difference, right? So indoor unit is higher than the outdoor unit. I would say that's probably gonna be the case most of the time, right? If it's up in an attic and this is down below. So it was from zero to 98 feet, right? That's a 10 story building, not too bad. We could also go down from zero to 98 feet, right? So great ranges. I mean, we could pretty much put this thing anywhere and most applications are gonna fit within that range. But you can see here, yeah, if I stay all right up to, let's say, 32 feet, from zero feet up to 32 feet, yeah, you're going to get your capacities in those charts. But once I go beyond 32 feet and I start going out to 65, 98, 131, you can see we got a multiplier here. So if we took the capacity in the chart you just saw before and we multiplied it by one of these capacities, and we'll do a little example here, right? So there's our 98, there's our 230. We're going to say we're going to run that thing out 98 feet, right? And in this case, it might not make a big difference. We're not talking a huge capacity loss when we stay, you know, somewhere in the middle or close to our um, pre-charge, which is 98 feet. That's why I picked that number. But if I did the math and I take that 28,000 that we had in the last chart, right, did it in 0.99, right? So we lost less than what, you know, 100 BTU, you know, it's called 140 BTUs we lost, right? At but minus five. Math, it's a little early to be doing that, but. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, at minus five degrees. So we worried about that? Absolutely not, right? Uh, I'm not gonna go pick another unit because I lost 140. But house, house might be 71 degrees. Yeah, right, exactly. I have a question about capacities. Can you go back to our uh, D&T? So uh, 
which is the lowest temperature optimum efficiency. Uh, I just wanted to show the yeah, that's a good question. total capacity where you see the arrow 28.44. That's okay. at minus five. The KW is the kilowatt input exactly. our IP. So there's 4.31. Yep. Now that's both indoor and outdoor at that point. Exactly. Uh, you can see it drops um, actually it gains 4.81. 515, 538. Yeah, we're probably going to be, you know, you can do some math if you know your, you know, what you're paying per kilowatt, right? And we can do some math, simple, uh, you know, math here, figure out what you're paying, and you can get a dollar value per hour, I guess you could say. But um, isn't it interesting though how it uses more warmer it's out? Yeah. And yeah. I think that's the gear ratio in our compressor. Correct. And which is how it's RPS. Yeah, all of that stuff. We yeah, we do give you the input power, right? So that's something that we could, you know, play around with. We know the COP of the unit possibly, right? You know, we can see how efficient that machine is. Um, Another good question here: How can you get 98 foot height with only 30 feet of pipe? You're not. Let's go back to that. I think you're looking at uh, meters. Right, exactly. So it's it's a North American chart, so Canada's involved. So imperial right. for us, metric for them. Exactly. I get what you're saying. You know, if I'm going up 98 feet, right, I'm going to have more than 30 feet of line set, right? So this is going to be up, and this is going to be length away from the unit, right? So your total line set at that case is going to be higher, right? So you're going to have 98 feet plus the 30, right? So that's going to be your total line set length. But this is more your distance from your indoor to your outdoor. So we can go out to 230 feet as long as we're, you know, in this case, 230 feet would be at zero elevation. Obviously, we would not be able to go out that far if we went up 98 and went over 230. We're going to be over the max of what this unit can do. So that's a great question because, yeah, this chart could get confuse you in that case. Yeah. Who is that? That guy deserves a T-shirt or something, man. I don't think anybody's ever asked that question before. I think it was Ramon. Ramon, awesome job. Just be aware, looking at this for the first time, that center line is dividing where the indoor is uh, above Correct. or below the outdoor unit. Yep. There are different ratings for a loss. Yeah, let's get to, I want to show you the further distance, right? So when we go out to that 230 feet, there is a considerable distance possible, uh, difference in, you know, in BTUs, right? So if we went out the full 230, right? So if I told you you can go 230, in most cases, you're going to push it, you're going to try. You might even go 231 feet, right? But if we did the actual multiplier at 0.828, uh, we're talking quite a few BTUs at this case, right? So now we're down to 23,000. You know, depending on my load, if, if the 28,000 was just enough here, or the 28,440 was just enough to, you know, heat our home, right? And I drop below that, well, that could be a problem. You know, that might be why you're calling myself, Anthony, you know, or our, our friends on the other side of the river, right? Because you're having a capacity issue or you can't cool or dehumidify or heat, you know, whatever the mode is. You know, you might be having some problems there and that could be, and we just want you to, we're not saying that's always the case, but we want you to be, you know, aware that these charts exist, you know, and if you're not doing a math or you're running far line sets, do the math to yourself and just make sure you're not losing more BTUs than you think. Uh, this could be um, a helping thing sometimes too. You know, we oversize equipment, you know, you know, I say a little bit here and there once in a while, right? Mm -hmm. um, but maybe I got to shed a couple BTUs. So running a further line set length, you know, to kind of drop down, you know, and hit a small room and, and shed some BTUs because the smallest I could go is maybe seven or 9,000. You know, that might be something that we can do as well. So it could be a tool or it could be hurting us. Just another quick question as far as can we add a hot water coil? Oh, that's a great question. Stay tuned. Now you're gonna stay for the whole webinar. The teaser. Yep, I'm gonna get there. The answer is yes. So we'll, we'll look at how we do that in a minute. Uh, yeah, um, we're doing a lot of that now. We're, we're seeing a lot of um, add-on stuff, dehumidifiers, all of that stuff, which has been great. So we look at the inside. If you're familiar with, you know, some of, some other air handlers that are out there today, some of this, uh, some of these components, you know, might look familiar to you. Right, so we got the heat exchanger, right, an aluminum coil that could be an N coil on a smaller guys, the two two and a halfs. Uh, then we go into an A coil for the three and a four ton. Um, our control box, right, that's where the, basically everything in here is Fujitsu. 
Everything else is another manufacturer, right? So we got the blower right there with the ECM motor. Here's our access here for our electric heater kit. So, very, you know, like I said, this isn't brand new to air conditioning. This has been around for a long time. It's just using a combination of inverter, heat pump, you know, outdoor units and everything else has really made us and the Fujitsu board in here. You know, the applications right now are unlimited. We're having a lot of fun with that. So like I said, you know, that is an ECM, it's an X13 motor. So that is a constant airflow motor. So it's gonna try and maintain a static pressure. So as your filter gets dirty, that motor is gonna try and ramp up. Just like if you're gonna put it on maybe some improper duct work, you know, it's gonna try and ramp up. So if you have motor failures, it's most likely because you don't have suitable airflow, right? That could be undersized duct work. That could be, you know, dirty filters all the time. Most of the time it's gonna be duct work. So we just gotta be mindful if we're doing a replacement that our ducts are, you know, able to move the airflow we needed to move. And when we talk about the controls that are available out there today, you know, typically today you're gonna to see this touch screen. That's gonna to be big across the Fujitsu lineup right now. That we're up to the UZ5 now since this, I gotta correct that. But you know, this is a great remote touch screen, but I'm not stuck to that. I don't have to use this all the time. Uh, it looks like some of my pictures got out of sorts here, but that's all right. Uh, we do have the other options, right? You know, maybe I don't want to see a wall mount on on there. You know, I maybe I, I could put a receiver in a, in a ceiling and use a wireless remote, just like I use all my with all my ductless systems, right? So we can do that. We do have some simple remotes here. You can see the yellow and the orange. Notice the notes down here below. You know, those are simple, simple remotes, but one we might not be able to do um, mode change, right, from heat to cool. Also, some of them might not be able to do function changes. So we just want to keep in mind if we have to do some stuff there, we might not want to pick that one remote or at least put the one UZ5 on today, make all your adjustments and then we can actually switch it over to a simple. Uh, we do have Wi-Fi and we do have, you know, some converters that are out there. We'll look at the external connect kit a little bit. There's a lot of little accessories depending on what you're looking to do. Remote sensor, I've used this a couple of times uh, recently. So this is another great addition here, another good accessory. So I'll look at that as well. Quick question. Sure. So it's pertaining to mobile homes, yep. I'm not sure why that matters, but think of it. <clears throat> if installing this in a mobile home, how would you factor in the duct size with the motor to prevent failure? I'm not really sure what the... Yeah, it's going to be pretty much on, this, on the smaller side, you know, on a two-ton. Uh, we do have, what's really nice is we have a, a function cone, a fu yeah, function code, is that Sean asking that? Yeah. Yeah, so Sean, we do have a function code where we can actually take away 10% airflow. So we, we do have some stuff built into the board there and, and behind the scenes that we can adjust airflow in that case. Um, I'm glad you mentioned mobile home because that's the accessory you see on here as well. If we're, if we're putting in an electric heat kit um, with a downflow, most of those are downflow applications. You know, we do need this accessory here um, that's gonna go basically a little curb that this unit's gonna sit on. So we, we don't wanna overheat the floor obviously with electric heat, but that's a great question, Sean. And yes, we do have some function codes. If that's something you do, you know, please reach out to us. You know, I'd love to hear more about, you know, those applications because this thing is uh, pretty well set for that. That answered that for me. So the electric heater, you know, we've talked about this a couple of times. You can see from two to four tons, we do have some different ranges, uh, minimums and maximums, right? So depending, and I'll show you in a few minutes, the different sizes that we do offer. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's a big range. If you know KWs to BTUs, I'm gonna have that up there in a second. Uh, we can get some good heat from this. We don't always have to go with a bigger unit to meet our demand if, if we're only gonna see our, you know, large demands on, uh, or I should say on our coldest day of the year on our design temp days, we don't see many of those dates. Right, so if we're putting a piece of equipment in that might be pricing us off the job just because of that, those three or four days, well, I might be able to go with, and we'll look at some capacity charts in a little bit, you know, might be able to go with a smaller unit, but go with a electric heat as a supplemental, or maybe even if there is another fuel source there, we can go with that to kind of cover. So I don't want to give away all of that, but we're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, basic installation, right? Connection points. So anytime we're talking about basic installation, clearances are always the first thing I think of. You know, obviously we, we've got to think about us. If you're installing what you service, you know, these are huge, right? We want the two feet in front. If we ever have to pull a coil out or pull a blow motor out, you know, you, you want that access. 
And that's not just, you know, if you're doing an upflow or downflow, you know, if you're doing a horizontal, the thing I hate seeing the most, and, and we'll talk about that, I think, in a next slide or two, you know, is having our supports blocking our front doors, right? So that's a service access. We want that clear. We'll look at how the proper ways of doing that is in a sec, but um, four inches or more on the side, right? So that's something, you know, that's more on the electrical side. You can see we have some knockouts here, right? So we do have, you know, quite a few options here as far as running electrical and all of that, but clearance is definitely your, your friend and your front is gonna be the most important. So talking about the four different ways that we can operate this unit, uh, this is an upflow installation, right? So out of the box as an upflow, we do not have to do any coil conversion, which is nice, right? So just pull it out, put it in place and you're good to go. If we're gonna do the downflow, again, you know, mobile home, like Sean just mentioned, you know, we wanna utilize that accessory, get that base there, and then we can put the unit on top. We do have to do a coil conversion before we, you know, we get it in place. So make, keep that in mind while it's outside. You don't wanna do this in the home. So you can do this outside, get it all prepped. It's fairly easy if you've never done it before. You know, grab that install manual off of there before you even get on site, you know, get it off the Connect website, connect.fujitsugeneral.com. And you'll be able to you know, just go through the manual. You'll see how to do the conversion. Very simple. Um, they give you all the tools, all the um, accessories you need to make that happen. So there's your coil conversion. We're now down flow. Coil gets flipped. So our drain pan's down here. And you're good to go. Horizontal left. Again, this is set up right out of the box. So no coil conversion required. Yeah, throw it up in the attic and you're good to go. If we are doing that horizontal right we have to do the coil conversion, right? So we're gonna flip that coil so that it's down below. We get our drain pan down here. And you're all set. What else might you need to do? Gotta move some thermistors. Yeah, relocate thermistors. Yeah, that's all part of the conversion. So you yeah. definitely wanna read that, right? Because now, as you can see in this picture here, we got some thermistors running in here, just like we do on a ductless system. We're measuring our pipe temp as well as our air temp. So these are all things that, you know, yeah, in the instructions, it'll show you what zip ties you need to cut. We do give you some extra ones so you can put them back, hook them back up to the board. You know, it doesn't take long at all. I think that's probably the only additional step if you've ever, you know, swapped a coil out like that before or converted it. Um, it's just unplugging the thermistors and cutting some zip ties, so it's not too bad. And this goes back to the support, supporting the, the system I was just talking about, right? So we don't want to see these, you know, threaded rod or whatever it is you got hanging from the, the rafters here. We don't want to see it in front of the doors. We don't want to see it just supporting the ends of the unit so it's sagging in the center, you know. You know, utilizing some plastic drain pans now, you know, these combination drain pans. You know, this could be a reason why you might end up with a crack or something. You start putting tension on this cabinet, you know, you could have some issues. So we want to support it properly. We are utilizing flare connections just like we do on all our ductless systems. So it's nothing different from what you've had in the past. Again, these are just like um, a typical, uh, I would say, air handler. The coils do come pre-charged. So we are coming through with about 5 to 10 PSI of nitrogen. So we pull those guys out of there. You know, want to make sure we put a backer wrench on there. I think you had a good view here. Yeah, we want to get something on there so we're not twisting the pipes up inside here in the coil. Make sure we release that. Make sure we actually hear the release of the nitrogen. If you do not hear a release of nitrogen when you loosen up those flare nuts there, we might have some issues with the coil. So we might want to pressure test that before we start hooking up line sets and thinking we're all finished up. Uh, never seen that happen before, but I'll mention. Guys that have done coils before, I've definitely seen that before. Whether it's not coming through from the factory or something happened in the factory where there's a leak, it has happened. So we do have some accessory flanges that do come with the equipment as well. I see these a lot, still wrapped up in a foam, and thrown away pretty much. Most guys don't know what they are. Again, we look at the installation manual, you'll see what we have there. We get two lengths here, and then we'll have to come in and just make a little bend and make a cut. We loosen the screws internally here inside the, um, the supply outlet, and these will fit right over it. You retighten all those screws, and you'll have a nice starter flange there so you can attach your gut. So that's a nice accessory that comes with the system. Uh, drain pan, you know, typical. We got our three ports. We got our vertical and our horizontal drain, as well as our, you know, main drains and auxiliary drains. So that's something, you know, we definitely want to make sure we're doing properly. 
We don't want to, again, I just mentioned it's plastic, right? So we don't want to over tighten that PVC adapter. We will crack the pan. So a little bit of plumber's tape on there, hand tight, and you're good to go. And whatever we're not, whatever ports we're not using, we just want to make sure that we are capping. We can, um, yeah, auxiliary, this is a good note, that's why I left this in here, is if you are running auxiliary drains, which most of us, I think, are, I just want to make sure that auxiliary drain is somewhere, you know, where it's going to be visible in the outdoors. Most people put this over over the gutter, so it's dripping, you know, on a walkway or something where the homeowner is going to be walking uh, this way. If they do see water, we do need to notify them. If they ever see water out of there, give us a call. Uh, we do like float switches, too. You could put a float switch in there. and then. Um, What's really nice, what, what Jitsu has done with this air handler is the connection points, right? So we do give you what we call, this is an external input. Uh, we give you this one, two terminals next to the remote terminals, and we'll look at all these connections in a minute. But I can run a float switch, and that's going to be a normally closed, if you notice here in the blue, right? That's a normally closed switch, right? So whether that's a float switch, or if that's maybe um, the alarms, you know, your little wet switches you want to put in your secondary pan. Right? We're going to hook up our normally closed uh, alarm contacts to this one and two. So what that's going to do is anytime I open that float, right, we're going to go in here. So default is operation stop. We're going to change this to an O2 to force stop operation. So if my switch or my float open up into the open position, I automatically go into a force stop. So this is a great way to protect the system. We don't have to go break a number three wire like we typically would on a ductless system when we're using a condensate pump or emergency uh, switch or something like that. So it's built right into the system, which is really nice. And as always, you know, we always recommend that emergency pan. Always. So line set insulation. I think this is probably a class on its own, I would think. Uh, we've spent a lot of time talking about line sets. You think about what we just talked about. That box is completely engineered. If you're walking in the door and you're doing that, that horizontal uh, left uh, installation where we're not changing a coil or anything like that, there's not much you've got to do to that box, right? Everything else is going to pertain to just running some wire and hooking up a copper line set and, uh, and duct work, a little bit more than a ductless system. But typically, this is the part that most people struggle with or where we see most of our problems, right? Um, one nice thing, doesn't matter what model you pick from the two to the four ton, extra low temperature heating including included there. We stay consistent with our line sets, five eighths, three eighths. So if we're talking multi-position air handler, we're only talking one size when it comes to a line set. Uh, we do give you some uh, adhesive stuff here. It's the, the gasket around the door, around your flare connections, as well as some foam like we do with all our ARU units. Um, so this way, extra protection there so we don't have to worry about condensation and stuff dripping down and doing any damage so they give you a lot of a lot of stuff there with the system so right from the comparison page right so we talked about the expansion valve just like ductless again you know our expansion valve is not in the indoor unit like a typical air handler it's going to be in our outdoor unit right so our line sets that are coming in that means one thing it means those line sets they have to be insulated from flare nut to flare nut inside to out right both lines Right. We don't have a three eighths, you know, copper line going in there. We're going to have two insulated lines going into the house. So we don't want to make sure that is done. If we if we have a you know loss of insulation over the years, you know, we should be maintaining that insulation, right? We should be protecting it, keeping it out of the sun. It's not going to last forever if it's sitting there with direct uh, sight to the sun. The UV will break it down. Uh, we start losing that, then we might start flashing inside this line set here, and we're going to start losing capacity, you know, start flashing before we even hit our coil. So this is something we want to definitely protect, make sure we take a look at it. You know, I get asked all the time, I'm sure the rest of the guys do here too, you know, what do we do for maintenance on a ductless? Well, I don't care if the only thing you did was just on the insulation side. That's something that we should be looking at. Oh, my favorite. And Anthony's going to like this because I added some job site photos to this. So uh, this is a little caution. It's, uh, you know, number one bullet point, right? I don't care what air handler you're replacing and what size the line sets are, right? Do not use existing pipes, right? That's right there out of the manual. Um, we never use, doesn't matter if it was, a you know, another ductless, whatever the case is, you know, we don't use existing. We need to replace our line sets. We're not flushing line sets and all of that stuff, you know. We're starting brand new. 
Um, I was on a job recently where they did that and it was our fault, you know, not mentioning names, but it was our fault that they lost all their money on their install because the system wouldn't work. Well, this is what I found upon arriving to the job, right? So it might be a little hazy, a little hard to see here a little bit. So uh, these were existing line sets from a unitary piece of equipment. You know, you can kind of see along the back wall here, here's the existing line sets. One's insulated somewhat, and the other one is bare copper. Um, one is oversized, right? So one was a three quarter inch, and the other one was, uh, was a three quarter or seven eighths, I forget, and then three eighths. They, they just sleeved the hour copper into the pipe and brazed over it. And then I found going down a vertical wall about four stories long, we talk, found two traps, which you can kind of see underneath this insulation here where my laser pointer is. Right, so there's our insulated line with a trap here and another one about another 15 feet above it. And now here's our bare copper line next to it. Right? And we'll want to wonder why the Fujitsu doesn't want to work. Right? So the, thinking we're going to save a couple bucks and use the existing line set, and this cost them probably the job and more. Right? So there's my little uh, don't use existing line sets. So flaring, again, this is nothing new. Uh, you guys know how to do this. We do this every day, right? So we just want to make sure we got the good, the, you know, great tools out there with deburring, getting rid of all of this copper that's sitting here that could ruin your flare. Uh, make sure we use a sharp cutting blade. You know, we're not using nylog. We're not using pipe, pipe dope. We're not using anything on this copper, the brass connection. We, if we have to put anything or you feel like putting something on there, you're putting a little bit of refrigerant, well, refrigerant oil, right? So POE oil on a face of the flare, and that is it. Right. Uh, this is where we need to get better, right? This is the torque wrench. We got a digital one up here. Doesn't matter which one you're using these days. You know, these are not Fujitsu numbers, so don't look at this and go, okay, I need a picture of this, right? These, this is a standard torque, you know, or flare nut, you know, torque, right? This is uh, doesn't matter what you're doing. You'll find these in the torque wrenches themselves. A lot of them pre-programmed. You find them on the install manual. We even put them in our Infinite Comfort app. So that's something else that we um, we kind of put these numbers everywhere for you guys to use. You know, if you don't have a torque wrench right now, you've probably had a couple leaks in in your past or if not in your future, right? We need to start using a torque wrench, right? There is no other system. We do have some stuff out there that's um, you know a little better quality when it comes to flares, you know, press flares, stuff like that. They are better. They cost a little bit more money. You know, a couple jobs of buying those fittings, you can buy a torque wrench and do it the right way, right? So, a little PSA there. Line set lengths, uh, be careful on the model you're working on, just like any other Fujitsu system and any other mini split, right? We want to, we have a pre-charge. You can see here on the smaller guys, 66 and 98 on the largers, um, the three and four ton. We can go up to 230 feet, like we were just talking about with our capacity charts and our multipliers, right? That 230 feet is pertaining to three and four ton only. I have 164 on my two and two, uh, two and two and a half. Uh, we can go a little bit further once we get into extra low temperature heating models. That's 246 feet we can go out to now, which is uh, you know a little, little more, right? So another 16 feet or so. Not too bad, but we got to pay attention to our minimums and maxes. So how are we looking? That's good stuff. Question about line sets and UV. I love it. People asking about our specs. Yeah, I mean, there is, um, let's see, Manson there, you know, is the insulation UV rated? You know, a lot of them say they are, what's the term we keep hearing? Nothing is 100% UV right. protected. Uh, that's the bottom line. You know, there are manufacturers out there that say whatever they want to say that this is UV, whatever. But nothing realistically is going to stand the time. You know, if you've got 15 years, 20 years of sitting outside, it doesn't matter what you have out there. UV is going to deteriorate. Um, it might last a little bit longer than maybe some foam insulation, um, but it's got to be protected. I mean, there are codes out there that are starting, and we're starting to see them, you know, areas near the city and, and maybe other territories where they are coming down on codes, you know, as far as maintaining. It's a code, maintaining every year. You know, there's manufacturers like New Calgon and, and some of these other guys out there. Um, they make stuff to go out there and protect it. You know, another one of my favorites is Airex. They make another vapor bag that goes over the line set, right? Um, 
those are all different ways of protecting the line set. It depends on what you want to do and how often you want to go back to the job. If you're charging for maintenance, that's a maintenance item, right? We're going there to change your clean filters and coils and everything else. Well, while we're there, whatever exposed you know line set insulation is there, we want to make sure it's protected and not deteriorate. Um, you know, we've seen, and I, I saw, I think it was at Joseph who mentioned, you know, um, you know, line sets and stuff like that, you know, line set leaks and stuff. We've seen that a lot, you know, we have a manufacturer that we've been very happy to work with because they, they're the only manufacturer that I'm seeing today that actually come into a solution. And I don't want to go off on a tirade, which I've already started, but uh, I love this topic. You know, I love educating people on this topic because it's very easy to point a finger and say, oh, that's, that's the manufacturer problem, but it's not, you know, it's an environmental issue in most cases. You know, we're seeing it more so now because of a design change and for better insulation, our values and stuff like that, you know, so we're trying to get more efficient. And of course that might cause some other issues down the road, but we have solutions for that, you know, and then we can talk further. It's probably almost that time to do one of those uh, webinars. We haven't done one in a while. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest takeaway I've always said is you got to consider the line set part of the system and it's a maintenance item. Yeah. And if you see more copper than foam, it's either repair it, yeah, rewrap, absolutely. or replace. Yeah, you know, the longer you go, degrading takes place. So yeah, we can talk about going some of these 230 feet. Yeah, but performance is something you're going to give up. And exactly. also all that exposed copper, no RV, I'm sorry, UV or the R rating rather, then uh, you might lose some performance there as well. So yeah, we can we can talk about that all all day long. And if you have some questions on it, you know maybe some different products that are out there, you know definitely give us a shout, send us an email. We'd love to continue that conversation. Uh, but anytime we make our connections and we run our line sets, right? We got to start by pressure testing. You know we hear all kinds of crazy numbers when we do our trainings. You know some really low numbers, maybe some higher numbers, right? Um, but where and I got I got it covered here with some question marks. Anthony's sitting here next to me, put in the chat, you know, when you're pressure testing your line sets, you know, on a mini split, on a Fujitsu system, what are you pressure testing to? You know, and what does your regulator go up to? You know, if you know that, you know, put it in the chat, you know, but these are, you know, anytime we're talking about, you know, line sets or any type of leaks in a system, we got a pressure test. You know, if you have a leak in a system that comes back after six months, that just tells me on the install, we didn't, proper, we didn't properly pressure test the system because you're going to find a leak. You know, leaks don't happen in six months to a year. They were there on day one. You just, we never, it was small enough to carry the system to that point, you know. Um, you know, but once we pressure test, you got any numbers popping up yet? <laughs> Nothing. Not yet. Um, but yeah, we'll throw it in there, but uh, check for what bubbles, you know, we want to make sure that's done. Once we're done, we release that nitrogen, we set up the vacuum, you know, vacuum pumps are not used as for pressure tests, right? Vacuum, vacuums are used to remove moisture from this and contaminants from the system. That's all they're there for, right? So we have to start with the nitrogen pressure test, release it down to a couple pounds, pull a nice vacuum. We want to get under that 500 micron, not go under 495 and, hey, we made it past 500, shut everything down, we're good. No, we want to get it down below for, for I don't know, 15 minutes, you know, let it sit there, shut the machine off, lock everything down. You know, we want to see that we're not going to rise to a certain level, right? So if you don't know those, you know, what those levels are, what those numbers are, you know, we have it in an install manual. You can also go to the ACCA pages or RSES, and they have some great guidelines on how to properly. This isn't a Fujitsu thing, right? This is just general air conditioning, right? Whether you're working on a refrigerator, where you're working on a split system, it doesn't make a difference. These are regular guidelines for air conditioning. So take a look. No numbers yet? No. All right, so we're going to move on. So that number for us, you know, when we talk about <coughs> pressure testing, 600. Right. So if you're not doing and you're not, you don't want to say what you're pressure testing to. If, well, if you're 550 to 600 PSI, that's where we want to be. We got to look at the machine. You got to remember, we're talking about heat pumps now where the, the actual operating pressures might be 450 to 500 PSI. If I'm operating system at 450 to 500, get my my regulator only goes to 400 and I can barely squeeze 350 out of it. You know, well, you're leaving a lot of leaks behind that you didn't find. You know, and there's some numbers, and if you, you know, if you've been doing it right and hitting 500, 600, then you know what I'm talking about, right? Because you might not hit 
than those numbers, and to and then you'll find a leak at over 500 microns. Or, um, sorry, I'm looking at the micron screen here. At 500 psi, you might start to see bubbles where at 400 you never saw them, right? So you think you have a tight system, and that's not the case. So we got to pressure test properly. Yeah, if there's any time that you don't want to waste, yeah. this is where you don't want to. Yeah, do those ones. Do this right. Yeah, again, we we hear a lot about you know how time is valuable, but you know, you've got to go back two or three times, you know, yeah, it's expensive. You know, you lost a lot of money, there, but you didn't want to spend an extra half an hour to pressure test or an hour to pressure test the system. Well, that extra hour cost you more money, not for Jitsu, you know, that extra hour of not pressure testing properly. So keep that in mind. Um, you yeah, know, it's all one big system as well. Yep. So a four headed system, that's all shared, one piping, one circuit. You're going to drop the whole system yep. and redo it. Question about what type of um, refrigerant in the future, if we're talking about Fujitsu here. Yeah, there's some uh, there's some things going around. I know on the J series or the commercial side, they haven't really made a decision, but I believe uh, Joseph, it's going to be that R32A. Uh, that seems to be where everybody's going, you know. So stay tuned. We'll see where we go from there. Uh, additional refrigerant. Again, this is stuff out of our install manual. Uh, additional refrigerant stays pretty consistent throughout all our models here, 0.43 ounces per foot over our pre-charge. So again, you'll find these charts in the install manual. So anything over our 98 feet on our three and four ton system, we're adding a little refrigerant. Anything over 66 feet on our two, and a, a two, two and a half, same 0.43 ounces per foot. We do the math, we'll have to add some extra refrigerant to the system. So easy stuff. Nothing really changes. Like I said, you know, this is, you can think of it as a ductless system because it's very consistent with what we do in the ductless world. It's just now we're, we're dealing with a little bit of duct work. Um, and we're gonna be a lot more efficient than what we've seen with other split systems. So wiring wise, again, this is gonna be the same as what we've seen in the past, right? So we have our connection or our, our um, communication cable, three wire plus our ground, that's 14 gauge wire. Remote controls, 22 to 16, non-polar, two-wired, twisted. You know, when you get to remotes, they do come with some wire there. Um, we've seen guys using, you know, reusing thermostat wire, and it does work. Just want to make sure we got the right size there. Uh, breakers as well. We want to make sure we got the right breaker in there. Two different breakers for the small guys, 30 for the small, 40 for the large. So we just want to make sure we're sizing our wires properly. You know, depending on distance, when we're talking about if you're not the electrical guy, then it might not be something you need to know, but it's something I would definitely communicate to my electrician. Uh, so we are getting a proper wire size. The last thing I want to do is have to come out to a job site to, you know, maybe diagnose some electrical issues to find out we don't have the right wire size and some other things are going on there. So Carrie's got a good question on minimum pipe. And um, if you want to answer it. Minimum pipeline, what if we can't meet that? We have to, we have to, Gary. Um, we got to hit that minimum, um, at least 16 feet of line set. In most cases, I don't think that's going to be, especially with the multi-position air handler, that shouldn't be an issue. Um, but any time we talk about a minimum, we if we have to, we coil up pipe, we have to coil up pipe. It's got to be horizontal, not vertical. We don't want to create any oil traps. Uh, the minimum there is to protect the compressor. You know, I know there's some other manufacturers out there that, you know, you know, they might not ask for it, you know, and then we've come across that even with some of the other stuff we're dealing with. And, you know, we, we feel it's important. So we're not going to go away from a minimum because, you know, you've got to start dealing with velocity issues. You know, you're going to hear noises in the pipes and vibrations, harmonics from the outdoor unit. Right. So the biggest thing is we want to make sure that that compressor is protected. And that's where all of our minimums come from. So and it's going to change. It might not always be 16 feet. It might be 10. It really depends on the system. Yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, single flare to flare. So right. we're running one minimum one way. It's not both pipes. That would make it really easy, right? Um, it's not eight foot and eight foot. You know, it's it's 16 from one, from the condenser to the air handler. So one way. There are minimums for systems, singles, and there are minimums for um, systems when you go into multiples as well. Yeah. So just be aware of that. Absolutely. The numbers need to add up. It's all about protecting the compressor. Get me oil back. 100%. So now we're going to look into some a little bit more detail as far as the components that are here, right? So you can see the whole electrical 
section, right? We got our remote terminals there. We got our connection cables. We got our inputs, right? So here's our one, two, three, and our ground. We have our remote and our external inputs here. So right next to the control. We have a 24 volt transformer as well. And then you'll see the Fujitsu board. We got some thermistor, excuse me, thermistors hanging out the bottom here. Uh, we have a terminal here. Might see if you can see the laser pointer. That's where we're going to hook up our electric strip heat. Makes it nice and simple. Then we got these are all accessories, and we'll, we'll take a look at that a little bit further. Uh, as far as remote connection, again, you know, this is not a 24 volt thermostat, right? This is DC communication. So we got a Y1, Y2. We're going to run that from our indoor terminal block to our remote control. Pretty simple. We put it all together. Again, you got your remote terminals, and then we got our Disconnect power coming in, L1, L2 ground, outdoor unit, one, two, three, and ground coming from outdoor unit to indoor. So just like a ductless system, and we just give you terminal blocks here for inputs and all kinds of other fun stuff. Uh, we do have a battery built into that. So if we want to save times, dates, schedules, all of that stuff, we do want to turn that to the on position. Um, it will not activate until you do so. Internally, the only dip switch typically we're going to play with uh, in the air handler itself is this continuous fan delay, right? So this is set one, dip switch three. It's the only dip switch that is in the on position, as you can see here on the right-hand side. Um, basically, that comes default from the factory. I don't know if it's still currently coming that way. We've had some discussion with some of the Fujitsu engineers. Um, when we're not using the electric strip heat, it might play around with the system a little bit. So I believe they were shipping this in the off position now, but if you do come across one and you're not using electric uh, strip heat, it's your choice to turn that dip switch off or on. I particularly like to turn it off on the applications that I've been on. Um, so it's something if, you, if you're not sure and you have a question on it, you know, send us a message, give me a call, we'll gladly answer that. Um, this was a slide I kind of threw in here this is going back to what I was talking about, electric strip heats and maybe picking a smaller unit and then going with a strip heat. You know, this is just as a reference page. Um, There's not a lot to see. And I'm not trying to point out anything in particular, but uh, depending on my load, you know, again, we talked about 20,000 BTUs earlier on a capacity chart. That was our load for the building. And you're going to see an example coming up. Um, but, you know, do I go with a larger system like this 24 to cover my load all the way down into those low temperatures? Or do I go with an 18,000 model, save some money for the homeowner, you know, get definitely lock up that job and I can use an accessory, you know, that, you know, might get a supplemental or like, um, get who was, who was that that was asking about our um, hydro coils, right? You know, maybe we can hook up to a hydro coil or something else that's supplemental. So, you know, we can look at this and even, you know, how much strip heat do we need? We'll take a look at this in a second, right? So if I go with a smaller unit and, you know, at a, if we happen to have a five degree day where I'm only getting 18,000 and I needed 20,000, right? I need some extra BTUs. How big of a strip heat do I need? You know, do you know how many BTUs we're getting? So here's a good, here's that example right now. So we need 20,560. We went with the 18 model and I don't know, maybe we live a further, little further north here and we're only getting 15,000 BTUs out of the unit on a minus five degree day, right? Well, if I have a minus five degree day or colder, I need some additional or supplemental heat, right? So in this case, I need an extra, what, 5,000 BTUs, we'll say? Let's call it 5,000 BTUs. Well, if you worked with KWs before and you know the difference, you know, this is something we call about balance points, right? I'm getting my performance down to what, 23 degrees, right? So if I pick this one unit, I can now, and just looking at this chart, I know I'm getting full performance at 23 degrees, I'm good. Anything less than 23 degrees, I need supplemental heat, whether that's electric strip, hydro coils, you know, you know, regular baseboard system, you know, whatever you want to control doesn't make a difference. We can control anything, but whatever you want to use as supplemental heat, we need to know what that additional BTUs are. You know, in this case, if I wanted to use electric strip heat, right, right, 1KW is equal to 3,412 BTUs, right? So 3,412 BTUs will get 1KW. We don't make a strip that small, but we can give you additional heat, right? Because maybe maybe we get colder than minus five, we need, we need more. But 1KW is going to give us an extra 3,400. That's going to put us to what? At 15,000, that's going to bring us closer, right? So maybe 2KW, that's going to cover our load. So we'll see what do we offer. 
right? I think uh, that might be the next slide we talk about. So adding those additional supplemental heat, maybe it's not electric strip heat. You know, I have these external inputs here where I can hook up another board and maybe control some other stuff off of it. We got some outputs, we got inputs that come on here. This is an accessory, right? But if I'm doing, and, and you can see, I'm sorry, CM67 here is this external heater. This is a plug that's meant for our electric um, heater right here, right? So these two wires come off. There is a bulletin, that's what this uh, slide is really um, talking about. But on the other side of these two wires, you're gonna have a Molex plug. That plugs directly into that. And based on a call, it's gonna send a signal to that relay, which is gonna activate our electric strip. Uh, these are the different models we have. So these are no different than some uh, other ones you might've seen before. So you can see the smallest we offer is a 3KW. So you do the math, 3KW is times 3,400 BTUs, right? We go up to 15 kW, so man, that would give us a, a lot more heat. If I went with a 10 kW, right, that's that's actually 34,000 BTUs, right, 3,400 of uh, kW. So we can get some serious, you know, heat out of these machines if we're utilizing this as a backup. Uh, we can use this supplemental. We can use it just for defrost. You know, you you tell us what you're looking to do, and we can pretty much adapt to it. This bulletin is something that is found at the on the Connect website, right? So this is something that you know we mentioned this a couple times. I think I've seen Anthony throw it in the chat probably about 65 times already. Um, but that connect.fujitsugeneral.com is where you're going to find all of these answers. So it says see the distributor for a copy. You could do that, or you can go to Connect and get it yourself. It's going to be a lot easier. Uh, but yeah, when we talk about external heaters, it doesn't have to be an electric strip heat. It can be pretty much anything. When we say external device, just use your imagination. You know, it relay. can be whatever it wants. Yeah, that, it's really just going to be a relay. And I'm going to show you a diagram in a second, you know, what we can do. But, you know, typically this is going to be our default coming from the factory. This is where it's set for auxiliary heater control one. Um, based off of these are all different ways we can control that external heater or heat pump. You know, maybe in some areas where I'm dealing with rebates, you know, I want my you know, heat pump to actually shut off at a certain temperature and turn on my external device based off of an outdoor temperature. Well, we can do that. We can set whatever that outdoor temperature is, and now we shut off our oil and we go to heat pump or vice versa. You know, whatever the case is, you know, and here's that case, auxiliary heat pump controlled by outdoor temperature one. So our primary heat is going to be our, let's call it, I don't know, what do you want your external device to be? Boiler. All right, we're going to be a boiler. We'll, we'll be baseboard, whatever the case is, an oil boiler. Well, at 23 degrees, I want to shut that thing off and go to heat pump, right? That might get you an extra, I don't know, $500 per ton on a rebate. Just throwing numbers out there. I don't know exactly. It tells me I have to leave to go to Florida. Yeah, exactly. I'm a snowbird. There you go. But, you know, whatever you want to do, you know, we can, we can do it. Um, you know, when you get to the design and technical manual, you can see up here at the top, you want to know how that operation is going to work, you know, based on temperatures, right? So here you go. I mean, I'm not looking to explain this in full detail, but it, it's pretty simple. If you get about this dash box underneath here and just look at the curve and these little lines on off, it's really all you need to know, right? As the temperature rises and gets within 1.8 degrees of our set point, we're going to be off, right? So you're not going to activate your supplemental heat. It's going to stay off until the temperature starts to drop. And when my temperature drops below or more than 5.4 degrees, it's going to activate my, my external heater or whatever. It could be a rib relay in this case, and we'll look at that in a second. Um, but that's as simple as it really is. Now, I have function codes where I can change this 1.8 and 5.4 temperature number. Right? We can change those differentials by function codes. So if that doesn't work for your application, we can make it tighter or we can make it wider, whatever whatever you choose. So these little charts, and, and some of them you might need to read them 1,500 times just to understand them. They get a little confusing, but um, if you have questions on them again, you know, we're here to help you. Um, yeah, this little gray area here. So if the temperature stays in that zone for a specific amount of time, and again, we can, functions number 71, we can basically tell it what that timing is, whether it's one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, you know, that's what that will turn on the external heater as well. So all little details there. Just a quick um, question about function settings. Yeah. Is this something that you're familiar with or aware of? Um, 
they're in the installation instruction manuals for every unit. So you'll have the function set for the indoor unit, and there's some defaults. Yeah. And this is major for the um, yeah, you multi-position air handling. I might even have one up in the end here. Yeah, throw it in the chat. Have you ever changed a function code before? Yeah. And James, he was asking about why we don't use uh, line dryers. Um, I think the, the simplest answer to that, James, is um, we're not brazen. You know, we're, we got the a same flared flare connection. As well. Yeah, we got a flared connection. You know, pretty nice, clean if we do it properly. Um, I think it's just yeah. another leak point. I yeah. think what you're doing with your evacuation and all that. Absolutely, um, absolutely. And we got, you know, we got our. I guess you can call them uh, biflow strainers for contaminants and stuff like that, already built into the machine, just like any other uh, ductless system. So that's a good question because it has come up in the past. Um, you know, but basically what you're seeing on the screen right now is, you know, this is a diagram that I put together for some uh, some of my contractors that are currently doing hydro coils. So who was that that asked before? Was that that was uh, James. The hydro coils? Yeah. Perfect. Oh, um, that was um, Manson. Okay. Perfect. So Manson, yeah, here, here you go. You know, if, if this is something you're looking for, take a screenshot of this, take a picture. If you want a PDF, email me. I, I'll send it to anybody. You know, if that's something I just threw up. I was could have put it in there in the handouts, I guess. But um, you know, this is multi-positional air handler. We utilize as a supplemental and backup as a hydro coil. And it's very simple, right? So we have a plug. So you're going to order this part number. That's going to get you a Molex plug that plugs into that CN47. It's going to be two wires. You're going to hook up. In this case, this is a 12-volt um, DC signal. So you just want to make sure your rig relay has a coil that accepts a 12-volt or activates on a 12-volt DC signal. When it does, in this case, it's going to close our normally open yellow and orange, which we send down to our RW or TT terminals on our zone control. Right, and then from there we take 120 volts, set it to the pump, and that's it. The hydro coil is on. You don't need a separate uh, aquastat here to control it. Everything would be time delayed, so um, the blow will most likely already be operating. Uh, what's really nice, and I, I mentioned backup here, right? So we do have a function code for backup heat. So if we had an error code, let's say we had some kind of problem with the outdoor unit, you know, and there's a list that you can find that list on a Connect site. Um, in the manuals for the AMUG, you'll find that depending on a certain error code, and there's a long list of them, if something happens to that outdoor unit, we can have a backup where it will activate our blower and turn on our supplemental heat, whether it be a hydrocoil, electric strip, whatever the case is, you know, and then we still have operation, we still have heat, you know, even though the outdoor unit is uh, in trouble, we need to get there to troubleshoot it. Um, these are the parts, right? It's a, it's a plug and a rib relay. I don't think it gets any simpler than that. And then we come into this remote and we set some function codes, which if you've never done, I don't know if anybody uh, answered, but if you've never done a uh, function code before, I'll show you what that looks like in a second. But here's a, um, you know, here's a multi-position air handler where we added a humidifier, right? This was an April Air steam humidifier, uh, utilizing their humidifier, their digital control, their field supplied transformer. And all we did was add a rib relay and what we call a UTY TERX, which is an external switch uh, based on you know, a demand. So we get a demand and an output, 24 volts to this rig relay. We close a contact in our switch here, and our switch, we, we put a scene together. You know, we, we tell it what we want it to do. If this switch closes, what do we want it to do? We want it to send a signal to the Fujitsu to turn the heat on with zero set point change. So what that'll do for me is turn my blower on, Outdoor unit most likely is not going to come on, so we're not overheating the space. If it needs the heat, it will come on, but we are now moving some airflow so we can get some steam into the area, right? And so this was um, some, a really nice application. And we did this one actually in conjunction with the hydro air control, so uh, hydro air system as well. So th this was nice. So this is what I threw in the chat, and this is kind of what Anthony was talking about, is there are some defaults, and this, this sheet will actually tell you what those defaults are, It'll actually give you a little description of what the setting change is going to do. But for a full description, you do need to get to the installation manual. So having the two of these together would work really good hand in hand. Um, I highlighted on this one just for reviewing, you know, the basic function changes that we do, you know, uh, maybe play with on, on most applications. Right. So this is emergency heat. You know, 
external heater and use in defrost. If I just want my electric strip to come on when we go into a defrost so I don't lose temperature in the home, hey, we can do that. Um, here was for, I want to say this might have been for Sean asking about the, um, was it Sean with the mobile trailer, uh, the mobile home? I believe it was. Uh, but here's our temper set up and down, right? So we do have a couple settings there to drop the CFM. So if we do have, you know, smaller duct work, smaller homes, right? We can fit that application. And like I said before, you know, if you're doing a heater kit, it asks you what wire size, what breaker, what key, what kit did you put in by model number, what control, refrigerant length, right? So there's a lot of information you can collect here on a sh one little document, get it back to the office, maybe for registration or just to keep it uh, this way if you have to go back. Um, you know, Anthony asked about the function codes. You know, if you guys have not done a function code, this is our UZ5 remote. This is pretty simple, right? We're going to hit this menu button down here. Um, we're going to hit the next page. That's going to get us into our maintenance menu. We'll click on maintenance. Hit the next page again. Here you can see we have test run. We have function settings. Those are really the two you might need. You know, I always recommend it on a new install hitting that test run button. That test run is really going to let you know if the system's operating properly, if you got the right amount of refrigerant, right? All of that stuff. If it can run in test run, it's going to be able to run in any other mode. <clears throat> but here we're going to click on this function setting button. And you'll see something like this. Address, you never have to worry. Everything residential is self-addressing, so we'll never have to touch that. Uh, function number, this is where we're gonna go back to that sheet and find a function code, right? I'm gonna click on that. I'm gonna go to the number. From there, I'm gonna click on the setting, right? So here's my function number up and down. We get that. We hit the setting button down here in the bottom right. And now we can go, you'll, see, you'll know what your default is because it's gonna come up on the screen. And then if, whatever changes I have to make, we're going to hit the up and down button and go to that. Once we're done, we hit the OK. You'll get a little, um, basically a warning. Is, do you want to perform this function change? You hit yes, OK, done. Um, you could do a multiple, you know, multitude of function codes at once. It doesn't have to be one at a time. If I had to set 10 of them, set all 10 of them when you were done setting them, right? Once we go back, we want to reset power after performing the function codes. We want to do that within a five minute window and leave it off for at least a minute or so, right? That What that's going to do is that's basically going to keep that in the actual board of the indoor unit. It does not keep it in the remote control. It just goes in the indoor unit. This way, if there was any type of power uh, loss or anything like that, we'll, we'll save those function codes. You won't have to go back to the job and reset all those function codes, right? So if we don't reset power, that might be something we have to do. There's a little teaser here too. You know, a lot of people ask, you know, why Fujitsu got involved with an air handler or ducted systems, right? Because we've always, we've been pushing ductless systems for so long. Uh, this is part of that reason, I believe, you know, and I, I love this product, you know, we talk about zoning, you know, and what we can do with a uh, multi-position air handler. You know, here we can do a multi-position multi air handler. By adding air zone, we are now ducting or basically zoning by group, you know, by outlet. Right? So depending on how many outlets and how many zones we really want, the system itself is, is a variable in, you know, capacity heat pump. Right, So it's going to drop down the capacity based on what it needs. So here I have the ability, and this will vary the airflow as well in the system. Um, but I can give you wired wireless remotes, wired wireless dampers. we got some controls here that can also take care of our supplemental heat. We can hook up radiant heat to this. Um, you know, There's really no limitations with this system. Um, you know, it's a cost to it, but again, you know, I can have a, a full central air system in my home, but I can get the benefits of maybe a ductless system by zoning individual rooms and maybe turning stuff off when not using. Uh, this is a pretty wild system. We do a whole to uh, separate training on this uh, with AirZone, but uh, definitely something if, if you've never seen it, take a look at it. Very flexible. Very flexible. How are we looking? So far, so good. Good. Doing an excellent job. Got a lot of questions. I like it. Like it or like it. So I said before, we are recording these webinars, right? So this is something that um, you know you guys have access to all the time, right? So if you're not currently um, you know doing these, or you're not you know you're watching a couple minutes and you're you're losing the, you know maybe time, whatever the case is, you know you have access. You know everything we've done for the most part. You know what does it take? A couple of days? We'll get. We'll say. Yeah takes our marketing team to kind of get these videos back up on our, on our page, so be patient. 
Um, we are in the works. I know we had a conversation with marketing last week, and they are building a new home for us. So uh, we'll be transitioning all of these to another page in the, in the near future. Um, but this is something that, um, again, you know, this is education. You know, we, we've done, I don't even know how many. I mean, I'd love to get a count. And find not out just for Jitsu. Yeah, not just for Jitsu webinars, you know, but we have our line sheet. Tons and tons of webinars we produce. I mean, you can see on the screen, you know, John Russell did the advanced hydronics. That's a four part series. Great class if you're brand new to advanced to hydronics and you want to know how to size and everything. Space pack, we've got a couple of them. The last couple of weeks we've been focusing on that. Um, you know, this every day AO Smith, you know, like Anthony said, you know, take a look at the line sheet or just go on this page. You can go through, see all these other webinars. Uh, definitely a lot of good information there. All right. So we should be just about there. So like I said, we left our information. I'm gonna, you guys can scan that code. If, you, if you've got a phone or you're not on your phone, you've got the computer there, you know, feel free to grab that info. Uh, this time, I mean, anything we missed. Well. Yeah, Gary, you could definitely, that's the latest question right there? Yeah, yeah. it's a, setting up the hydro coils of primary heating. Yeah, yeah, just like if, if you saw that slide I had of what's the primary and what's the secondary, we can, you choose. You want the pri you want the hydro to be your uh, primary? Sure. When, when do you want it to shut off? Outdoor temperature, indoor temperature differential, you know. That's cost of fuel. Up to you. Yeah, what, what is it? KW versus uh, therm of gas or gallon of number two. Mm-hmm. If that's what you're running with, propane. I mean, endless. You, I always say you're you're limited by your creativity. That was Fujitsu Douglas handling 2023. Joseph, that is above my pay grade, my friend. Yeah, I told him. Great question. That's a great question. Um, you know, some things. There's some big changes ahead. You know, so stay tuned to that. Uh, new models, obviously. Um, they're doing a great thing with some of the new equipment coming out, trying to slim down. You know. How many condensers we have, you know, trying to make it easier and more flexible, you know, adding, you know, cassettes stuck to models instead of all one to ones. But yeah, there's some stuff going on there. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm struggling with people to get through 600 psi pressure tests. I mean, worried about COP twos in 2023 right now. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a, that's a great question, and you'll you'll. Unfortunately, you have to sit, find out what's coming forward. I mean, there's definitely some changes, uh, but they're on top of it. You know, existing duct work. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, we don't get involved with code. I mean, if you're getting jobs inspected, I mean, that's something you, you want to be careful. You know, if, if you're not, you know, if you're working on a job as a retrofit and that duct work is not there and the homeowner's not looking to spend the money, I mean, the good thing about it is you don't have to take that job. You know, it's don't get yourself involved with something you're going to have nightmares with for the rest of your uh, career here. Um, Seer reading for our air handling? Yeah, so we go up to 19 Seer, James, um, with the smaller guys. It drops down a little bit um, from nothing below 16 Seer with those air handlers. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of retrofits out there. I mean, you know. 100%. You know, when we released this air handler, I mean, we knew there was going to be a big demand, you know, but not as big as, you know, I don't think we really anticipated how big of a demand it really was. So, yeah, we might be struggling a little bit with some equipment right now, but yeah, it's what we're doing. Um, we do retrofits, obviously. Yeah, you know, I got and, and I, I think this is going back to where your question was about um, the duct work. You know, you're, right. you're looking at 410A systems now that were adapted to really poor R22 systems, you know? So you really didn't have sufficient duct work there and now we're putting on something else. Um, the good thing is, is we're more forgiving, you know? And one thing I didn't mention is, you know, we go up to one inch of static with these systems. Uh, so we're more than capable of handing, uh, handling those high, you know, resistant systems, but we don't want to, because that's why these motors kind of struggle and will burn out over time. But, you know, yeah, we do have, these function codes for more or less airflow, um, the system will drop its speed. So we do have some good things with a variable capacity that might see you maybe adapt to those poor ductwork situations a little bit better than something you're probably currently doing. So great questions. 
All right. I think uh, I think we're about done here. It looks like all the questions kind of stopped. Good conversation. We appreciate you guys. It definitely makes this a lot easier and a lot more fun when we have these conversations throughout. So we appreciate you guys. Um, they like said I think next week we'll end our spring training, I guess you can say, you know, as far as mm -hmm. webinars go, what's going to take the summer off and we'll be back in the fall with some webinars. And like I said, you guys have access to all the recordings, so you can keep watching them. If there's topics you guys want to see, you know, something that we do cover, you know, in our product lineup, you know, we'd be more than happy to entertain it. You know, we're always looking to come up with new stuff and add to what we currently have. So yeah, anything that you guys are thinking, send it over to us and, uh, have you been attending live trainings as well? Yeah, how have live trainings been for you? You know, it's I know right now things are a lot busier than what we were, so it's harder for you guys to get into rooms, but we're, we're ready to go. You know, we've been doing them. Our room's been filled many a times. we got some events going on after this and throughout the rest of the week, so we're happy to see you guys. So if live training is something you're looking for as well, feel free to reach out. Any One of the five of us would be happy to entertain those as well. All right. All right, guys. Thank you again for spending your time, and uh, we'll see you next Wednesday for A.O. Smith Water Conditioning, and Mr. John Russell will be covering that, and uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up after that. Have, have, a good. Great, have a great day, guys.